Today we'll be looking at Jeremiah chapter 10 in our studies in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. And it's pretty straightforward, and the chapter can be divided basically into the two sections. And the first section, verse 1 to 16, uh, idols are contrasted with the living God. And the second section, verse 17, running to the end, I think it's verse 25, uh, is really the consequences of that. The consequences of the fact that Israel had taken up uh, uh, idolatry and had rejected the living God. The consequences would be they would be taken into captivity into Babylon, uh, that uh, Jerusalem and the temple would be laid waste, and they would be uh, a, a captive. Judah would be made desolate. <clears throat> uh, basically, that's, the, that's the, what the chapter is about. Uh, there's not a lot of difficult verses in it to understand. Maybe some place names and so on that uh, you can look up on your own, but I'll give a, a brief overview of it <clears throat> to help you in your study of it. Um, the Lord exhorts them uh, in verse 2. The word of the Lord comes uh, to Jeremiah, and he speaks to them. Uh, in verse 2, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Uh, do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. Now, the way of the Gentiles um, of that period was idolatry. It's still in many parts of the world, uh, we could say that uh, in a certain respect that idolatry is sort of the keynote of uh, worship of the Gentiles. Even in large sections, for example, of the Muslim world where professedly idolatry is rejected, that's sort of a main tenet of the religion. But once a year when they go on the Hajj, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, there's a huge black box in Mecca that they... Uh, march around it essentially is idolatry um, <clears throat> and of course in Buddhism and Hinduism and and all the animistic uh, religions are still prevailing in many parts of the world but it was pretty well universal uh, in the time that Jeremiah was written Israel was to be a witness against it but they copied the worship of the Gentiles they began to worship the idols of the Gentiles do not learn the way of the Gentiles Paul makes this clear uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, about the, the Gentiles uh, worshiping idols. If we want to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul says, um, rather the things that which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. And there he's saying that the idolatrous practice of the Gentiles was really the worship of demons. The idols themselves are nothing. We'll see this as we go on in the chapter. Uh, useless and vain, uh, futile, but uh, taking hold of the conscience of the worshipers where they um, projected uh, divinity to inanimate object, objects and so on. Uh, Satan got a hold and uh, the demons enter in. Uh, so the demons are really behind uh, the idols. <clears throat> and he says in verse 2, going on in verse 2, do not be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, or the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. And that's the signs of heaven uh, here in verse 2 is a reference to uh, the um, uh, celestial bodies, you know, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Indeed, in, if you can turn to it, I won't take the time to turn to it, but you can turn to it yourself. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, it says of the celestial body uh, that they were created for signs. God has given signs, and he gave signs through the heavens. Uh, <clears throat> but, for example, a main one it would be when the Lord Jesus died and he was made sin on the cross, that the, the, the sun darkened. You know, that was a sign. But with, uh, but with the Gentiles, uh, they imputed uh, a prophetic power uh, to the celestial bodies, um, and we're afraid of them. That's what verse 2 is suggesting. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are futile. And so they they saw the sun, the moon, the stars, and they uh, projected deity upon them, that they took the created heavens and, and turned them into uh, the creator himself. They turned uh, from the creator to the creation. Paul uh, develops this in some detail in Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> uh, 
the, the worship of the Gentiles. I don't want to go into too much details about that, but just to give you the uh, idea of what uh, the Lord is saying here. So uh, he's warning them, don't follow the path of the Gentiles who <clears throat> worship, you know, the sun and the moon, the stars, and also the work of their own hands. And that's what's described uh, in verse 3 to 5, the construction of the idol. He says uh, in verse 3, for the customs of the people are futile, for one cuts a tree from the forest. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe, they decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. Now, some have thought that these verses are referring to the Christmas tree, you know, cutting down a tree of the forest and hanging silver and gold on it and nailing the floor. But that's not what's really being described here. I'm, I'm not making a statement of here upon Christmas or Christmas trees, negative or positive, but I'm just saying that these verses are not describing that. They're simply describing uh, the construction of an idol. You know, a tree would be taken, cut and down. Of course, it would be stripped of its branches and bark and everything. And the, 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 um, idol would be fashioned from the wood and then it would be covered with with gold or silver and then made to stand upright fastened in its place it's sim simple that's what that's what is being taught here and explained here <clears throat> and then verse five they are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak they must be carried because they cannot go by themselves do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil nor can they do any good so they're futile there's nothing that they can do in fact, they have to be carried about. They can't even walk, uh, is what uh, the Lord is saying here through Jeremiah. And the Apostle Paul, uh, again, uh, says a similar thing in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, in, in Corinthians, <clears throat> the first epistle of Corinthians, Paul speaks a lot about idolatry because the Corinthians, Greeks, came from the world of idolatry. But Paul here speaking uh, of the Christians, and verse 4, he said, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other God but one. The Paul says, We Christians, we know the idol is nothing, it's just a piece of wood, like we have here in Jeremiah, a wood covered with gold or silver, or it's a it's a metal, or it's a piece of stone or rock, or it's a one of the created uh, heavenly bodies. They're they're nothing. They're just they're just uh, um, inanimate objects. They have no life, uh, and they can't do anything. They're futile. And so the Lord is exhorting the people of Israel, do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do uh, evil, nor can they do good. And then we get the contrast between those idols uh, with the living God. And we see this in verse 6. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, now it's Jeremiah speaking, you are great, and your name is in might, uh, who would not fear you, O king of nations? So the Lord says, don't fear the idols. And Jeremiah says, no, we fear you, O Lord. You are the king of nations, for this is your rightful due. <coughs> Excuse me. For among all the wise men of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Uh, they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish, which we believe is probably Spain. Uh, and gold from Euphaz, and the work of the craftsmen, and the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their clothing, and they all work uh, are the work of skillful men. So again, what Jeremiah is saying here is that <clears throat> these are just created, and, and the idols are created by the hands of men, men who can walk and talk and see and think and do things. Uh, the, the idols are created by them, so they're created, created objects by the hand of man. <clears throat> so you see the, the, the foolishness of it, in making them into gods. And then uh, again, the contrast with the living God, verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. I would just say this <clears throat> term living God is one we get throughout the scriptures. And generally it's uh, in contrast with, uh, again, with, idol with idols, which are not living. And he is the living God, the true God, who, who sees and knows and is involved in our affairs. Actually, the term living God is used some 42 times in the Bible, both uh, in the Old Testament and in, in the New Testament. The first occurrence is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 26. 
And the last occurrence is in Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. <clears throat> Uh, and we may want to look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, where Paul is speaking about the conversion of the Thessalonians, who also were Greeks and idolatrous, those who were not uh, from amongst the Jews. Some of them have been converted from Judaism, but the majority have been converted from paganism. And Paul says, For they themselves declare, that is the people that have heard about the conversion of the Thessalonians, for they themselves declare concerning us, what manner of entry we had to you, that is Paul and his uh, colleagues when they came to Thessalonica, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There we get the New Testament uh, uh, um, statement that God is the living God, one of them. Serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, or who rescues us from the coming wrath. Um, so here we get the three elements of, of uh, repentance in the New Testament. Turning to God, turning away from idols, and waiting for the Son of God from heaven. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the Christian um, pattern of repentance. Here in the Old Testament, Christ had not yet come. And it's simply a call <clears throat> to turn away from the idols and turn to uh, the living God. And in verse 10, he's described as the true God, the living God, and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble, and all the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Verse 11, thus you shall say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under those heavens. <clears throat> that These gods didn't create anything. Uh, they were rather created things. And when um, ultimately uh, that those very uh, so-called gods, those created gods, those idols, they themselves would perish. They would perish from under the heavens. They will turn to dust and crumble. <clears throat> and then again, the contrast with God, verse 12, he has made the earth by his power, uh, where the contrast with the idols that they can't do nothing, they can't see anything, they can't say anything, they're fastened in their place, and eventually they'll just crumble and disappear from the earth. Rather, uh, the, the Lord actually has created the earth. He has made the earth by his power. The very elements that men took from the earth to make the idols, God created that. He created the, the, the trees, the wood, the, the rocks, uh, the celestial, the signs of the heavens, the stars, the moon, the sun, all these things. He has made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for rain, and he brings wind out of his treasury. So he's just describing creation <clears throat> and the natural creation, how God has not only created, created it, but he sustains it. We get that Colossians chapter 1. He upholds, he sustains all thing, he, things. Hebrews chapter 1 says the same thing, using a different word, that he holds all things. He upholds them. Uh, and some of this terminology that we have here in Jeremiah, uh, verse 13, is very much like we find in the book of Job, <clears throat> where the uh, even the patterns of the weather and, and the climate and so forth are in God's hands and under his control. <clears throat> and then in verse 14, everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image, for his molded image is falsehood. Uh, there is no breath in them. Speaking again of the idols, they don't even breathe. There's no life in them, actually. No spirit in them. They are futile. That is vain or empty. Uh, a, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. So God eventually will put away all idolatry and they will perish. But verse 16, which sort of concludes the section, which contrasts the idols with God. The portion of Jacob... That's a, a terminology to describe the living God. He's the portion of Jacob. He was Jacob's portion, Jacob's hope. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things, and Israel, the tribe of his inheritance, the Lord of hosts is his name. So that concludes the first section of chapter 10. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm still struggling a little with this stubborn cold. You just bear with me. I'm halfway through here, so I think I'll get through it. So the second section of this chapter, verse 17 to the end, 
describes the consequences uh, for their idolatry. You know, disobedience and rebellion brings consequences. All our decisions, whether good or evil, have consequences. And obviously, uh, to reject the living God and to worship idols has consequences. And so we see this with what happened to Judah and the people of Israel. Verse 17, gather up your wares from the land, O inhabitants of the fortress. For thus saith the Lord, behold, I will throw out at this time the inhabitants of the land and will distress them that they may find it so. Again, a prediction, one of many, many predictions in Jeremiah that they would be taken into captivity. <clears throat> the inhabitants of the land would be thrown out. And then uh, we get uh, God's heart because this. God takes no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. And uh, I believe it's Isaiah says that judgment is his strange work. It's not his usual course of things. It's only when he must judge that he will judge. Uh, he's reluctant to judge. He's slow to anger. The scriptures speak of this again and again and again. And so we have here his heart is not uh, happy about this, that he has to do it. Verse 19, woe is me for my hurt. My wound is severe. But I say, truly, this is an infirmity and I must bear it. It's something I have to, to bear, an inf like an, infirm an infirmity, like some physical malady that he can't get rid of. Just like the Apostle Paul with his thorn in the flesh. God is saying, this is an infirmity that I, you know, I have to, it's my cross I have to bear, that I have to judge my people. It's not something he rejoices in. <clears throat> and um, verse 20, my tent is plundered and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me. And they are no more. There is no one to pitch my tent anymore or set up my curtains. Now, the tent here and the curtains and the, and the, the cords and so on, that's reference to, you know, God's uh, so-called dwelling place in Judah and Jerusalem. First, uh, the first was in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then the tabernacle was in Shiloh. And then that was destroyed. Then the temple was built in Jerusalem and then rebuilt Eventually, again, the second time, but that's not what's being referred to here. But the first temple and the tabernacle um, is going to be destroyed. And so there's no one left in the land to, to you know, bring offerings <clears throat> uh, to, the, to, the, to the place of worship in Jerusalem because everyone would be taken into captivity. He says at the verse, end of verse 20, my children have gone from me. I love how the Lord says this. My children have gone from me. Uh, God has a heart for his people and is slow to judge them, slow to let them feel the consequences of their sin. But now it must be, and he's grieving over it. And, you know, some of us who are parents, maybe who have a prodigal child who has turned from the things of God and has gone into the world, our heart is pained because of it, and we pray for them. And so you have the sympathy of God in this. The sympathy of God. I always say that the, the, the Lord is the one who wrote the, the story of the prodigal son. He described the father waiting at his house, waiting for that prodigal to trudge up the road again. The Lord wrote that parable. So he, he has sympathy. He knows he has a heart of, of, a, of a father toward the prodigal. And so here, my children have gone for me. There's no one left to set up my curtains uh, to bring worship. And then verse 21 for the shepherds have become dull hearted and they have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and their, all their flocks shall be scattered. You see, this is sort of metaphorical language here. And throughout what we've been saying, like when he's speaking of the tent and so on. But here the shepherds uh, are not the literal shepherds on the mountains of Israel, but he, he's referring to the leaders, you know, the priests and the Levites and <clears throat> and the kings and so on. They were dull-hearted and they did not seek the Lord. Therefore, the consequences are that the people will bear the punishment. Uh, all their flocks shall be scattered. They're going to be taken into captivity into Babylon. And so verse 22 uh, becomes more specific where he says, Behold, the noise of the report has come and a great commotion out of the north country. That's reference to the Babylonian armies. And remember in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, uh, Jeremiah saw that initiatory uh, uh, vision as he received commission from the Lord that he saw a, a, a boiling pot. 
uh, uh, facing them from out of the north. And it was a reference to the Babylonian armies that were going to come to Judah from the north. All the enemies of Israel generally, uh, even though they're in the east, when they attack, they come from the northerly direction because uh, just west of them is all desert. So it has to go up around by Mesopotamia and come down through Syria and Lebanon. So it comes from a northerly direction. That's the reference here, a great commotion out of the north country. To make the cities of Judah desolate, a den of jackals. Well, that's what's going to happen. Jeremiah's prophesying of it. We have the historical perspective, uh, historical fact. We can look back and say, yes, uh, 586 B.C., uh, the Babylonians came and raised the city, burned it to the ground, destroyed the temple, and took the, the last of the remnant there into captivity. Then verse, the concluding verses, uh, verse 24 and 25, um, is a prayer of uh, Jeremiah, uh, and it's a, what we call an imprecatory prayer, where he's calling upon judgment for the Gentiles, even though the Gentiles are fulfilling God's will in disciplining and judging the people of Israel. Nevertheless, they are responsible. Uh, they're not puppets. They're responsible for their sins, for their crimes. Let's just read it. O Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you and on all the families who do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob, that is Israel, devoured him and consumed him and made his dwelling place desolate. So Jeremiah is calling for judgment on the Gentile nations uh, for their uh, ultimate um, crimes that they would commit in uh, taking the people of Israel captivity. You see, it was God's judgment, and this is the sovereignty of God. It was God's judgment and reluctant judgment, as we've seen, his heart was broken. It was his infirmity, something he had to bear, but he allowed it. He brought them. He raised them up and brought them. Yet they also are responsible. They're not puppets. They're responsible for what they have done. And this is the amazing mystery of how God's sovereignty works, where man is fully responsible and he carries out his own wicked designs, but God is overall ruling all, as Brother Darby used to say, God is behind all the scenes and he's moving all the scenes that he's behind. And with this respect, I think of uh, Peter's um, statement in his sermon in Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 23, where he says, Him, that is Christ, being delivered by the determinate purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put the death. In other words, the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross was God's determined purpose from before the foundation of the world and was through the foreknowledge of God. But uh, he's charging the people that crucified him, the Jews of Jerusalem at that time, with a responsibility. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. In other words, it was their own evil heart. They delivered him because of envy. Pilate knew that. Pilate saw through that. They delivered from envy. They were they hated the Lord Jesus. And, and so they were not puppets or robots. Uh, it was, uh, they're responsible for the crimes if they didn't repent. Uh, there's blood guiltiness if they don't repent. Um, but nevertheless, the cross was also God's uh, predetermined counsel and his foreknowledge. So you see these two things coming together in God's sovereignty. We can't explain it. You know, someone says, I, I don't understand this, how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility works. I don't understand how God is infinite. I don't understand how uh, God does this or God does that. Look, if we have a God that we can understand, then it's just the God of our understanding and no God at all. Uh, our God in that sense is beyond our understanding. But we're very thankful, beloved, that he has revealed himself uh, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, a man, and one blessed person. No man hath seen God at any time, but the only begotten, the unique son, he has revealed him. May the Lord bless you today uh, as you continue on, I hope, in your study of Jeremiah. And again, I hope these little talks give you a little indication or 
idea of what is involved in each chapter as we go. Amen.